الحمد لله رب العالمين صلاة والسلام على سيد المسلمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين First of all, I'd like to thank you for attending. Uh, I know the regular Duroos, inshallah, will be after Isha on a Friday. After Isha on a Friday. But uh, I think the masjid has other plans for, uh, for tomorrow. There's another Mahalar, inshallah. So we've changed it today. But I ask Allah to make this beneficial for us all. Uh, the main thing is consistency, and inshallah, we'll try to be consistent as much as we can. Uh, and the books that we have chosen to study, inshallah, are, are two books by a famous Imam from Ahl Sunnah. And these two books have been relied upon by many of the scholars, especially in Najd. They teach these two books simultaneously. Uh, one of the books is focusing on Aqidah. Another one is focusing on uh, the second pillar of Islam. The first one is on Usul uh, al-Thalatha. I think this is well known to all of us, inshallah. This is the first pillar of Islam, as you know. Now, just to give you a short summary about what the book is about, is uh, it's about the three questions in the grave. I think there's some sisters, that's why. Otherwise, I'll just sit in the back. Uh, it's about the three questions in the grave. Who is your uh, Lord? Who is your messenger? And what is your religion? Uh, obviously, these are the questions that everybody needs to be firm in. If you fail to know these questions, then you will be a failure when asked these questions. So it's extremely important that we teach the meaning of these three questions and what it entails. Because a lot of Muslims, unfortunately, today, they say, La ilaha illallah, but shirk is prevalent. Uh, uh, disobeying the messenger is also there Honouring the religion is also not you know, Visible for us to see So inshallah we'll take some of these Characteristics of what La ilaha illallah means And these three three questions And also the second book is Adab Mashir al And like I said the scholars Used to teach these Or they still do teach them simultaneously I know some of them in the Haram in Medina etc They teach these books simultaneously Because this is about the first pillar of Islam And this is about the second pillar of Islam and it has masail and it has issues in there that give extra tafsil, that give extra uh, extra benefit. So inshallah we'll study these books. But today I'd like to have just like an introduction to uh, uh, what these books are about and to give it some kind of context. And the only way we can give it some kind of context is if we know who the author is. And he's obviously very illustrious. I think a lot of people have, have heard of him. But unfortunately, his name has now got a lot of negative connotations to it. Even at his time when he was, av- uh, when he was alive. But now even more so. And from the way of Ahl Sunnah and from the way of the scholars of the past, is that they gave credit to him and they gave credit to the ulama as well. If you look at one of the books up there, I think maybe it's about 20 volumes long, Seer, Alam al Nubala. And that's just about the life of the scholars and what. You can learn from the life of the scholars. And Imam al-Dhahabi, he doesn't just narrate the life of the scholars. And this is from the the Qur'an as well. So Allah teaches us about the life of the prophets and about the benefits that you can get from it uh, by telling us stories, about narrating these stories to us. So there's a lot of fawaid when we're looking at the life, especially of the people of virtue, because... Every moment of their life was virtuous. Every single plight they went through, and every, every kind of they, every time they received a favor from Allah, it was also lessons that you can learn, and it's full of virtue. So the author is Sheikh Al Islam Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab Ibn Sulaiman Ibn Ali. I love mercy on him. He was born uh, in Hijri, one thousand one hundred and fourteen, and he passed away, one thousand two hundred and six, which is approximately. 300 years or 200 something years ago. Uh, like we said, he's a controversial figure, but unfortunately, his da'wah is quite clear. If you look at his own personal statement, or what you could call a personal statement, uh, in the volume that's been connected by uh, uh, some of the ulama of Najd, Dura Sunniyah, 
he talks about it, and inshallah we'll touch upon this uh, a bit later on, but all he called to was Tawheed and Sunnah. He didn't call to extremism. He didn't call to uh, radicalism. He didn't call to killing people. He didn't call to declaring people as kuffar. But this is the controversy, the controversy that his name has now been attached to, unfortunately. And his da'wah was not political. If you look at his life, and we shall look at it, inshallah, the, the, the origin of his da'wah was never political, but he's become politicized, unfortunately, even today. When you think of the name Wahhabi and Wahhabism, people would automatically connect it to Daesh, or they're connected to Saudi Arabia, or they're connected to some kind of extremism. But his, his, his rhetoric was never extreme. So there's a lot of confusion when it comes to that. So the Sufis, on one hand, claim he was a takfiri, and he called to mass killing. So now when you see something like this happen in the news, in the media, in, in the world today, the Sufis will click to point the finger and say, look, this is what the Wahhabis are doing. We need to stop Wahhabism. But the other side, the flip side, are the extremists themselves. They will quote Abdul Wahhab and say, look, this is what Abdul Wahhab preached. And we will see also in the seerah of Abdul Wahhab, when they had the power to remove some kind of munkar, they did it. And Daesh and these people are using this kind of, you know, uh, of, of rhetoric. So it's, he's completely misunderstood. Like we said, all he called to was kitab and sunnah. Not any level of extremism anywhere. So to understand his life, we have to understand the geographical background of what Najd was about. What is Najd? Najd, if anybody's lived it or been to Saudi Arabia or Riyadh, they will know that Najd comprises of Riyadh and the surrounding areas. So we have Yamama and Dariya, uh, Zulfi and Ghat, Jubail as well, Uyayna, Huraymila, which is a very uh, important point, point of his seerah as well. And all of these places are still uh, uh, you know, populated today. His dawah is still affected there. And some of the buildings are still the same buildings that were there at the time of the Wahhab, 200, 300 years old. So you can see that now that the barakah of the dawah, and you can tell when somebody's dawah is correct, is when the dawah remains. If you look at the time of the Prophet, ﷺ, Medina is still Muslim. When he liberated Makkah, Makkah is still Muslim. Ta'if rejected him, but he went back and he had sabr with him. But what happened? It's still Muslim. So you can see that the dawah, you can see when there is barakah, when somebody's upon the haqq, that Allah puts barakah in the dawah. And Allah says in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ اَحْتَدَوْا زَادَهُمْ هُدَىٰ وَأَدَاهُمْ those who are guided, Allah increases them in guidance and He gives them taqwa. And some of the Mufassirun have said that you can tell the alamat of Qubur, you can tell that the person is accepted with Allah and his uh, da'wah is mubarakah and what he is upon is, is khayr, is when his, the goodness that he is upon leads to more goodness. The goodness that he is upon is more. It doesn't necessarily mean that he has to be on a da'wah on, on a large scale. You can just look at it from yourself. If one day you are praying salah, next day you are not praying salah. You know, you have to think about where you are in life and your connection with Allah. However, if you are leading salah, if you are establishing salah, then you lead to doing more good deeds. Then you can see that there is barakah in your life. And inshallah, it's a good sign from Allah that Allah is giving you guidance. And He is supporting you in, you know, pleasing Him. So this is an important point. I mean, I don't want to dwell upon it because like I say, this is about His seerah. We're going to look at His life, inshallah. And we're going to look at some benefits that we can... You know, derive from it, especially in our everyday life here. So, um, originally, the leadership there was uh, from a from a tribe called uh, Huda al Hanafi and Thumam al Hanafi. This is the the main influence that was there. Now, we have to take this also into consideration here that from the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then the Umayyads, and then the Abbasids, it was it was never ruled under a khilaf. It was never ruled under a khilaf, and we'll come back to this. Or maybe we can talk about it now. Some people claim that he did khuruj, he went against the Ottoman Empire and uh, he did takfir upon them and he fought with them and he rebelled against them. And this is what the Daesh people are saying now, that we can do this against the rulers. But if there is no rule set in the land, then how can you do khuruj against the hukam? How can you do khuruj against the, uh, the, the, the rulers? So this is well documented in Najd history that this land, and anybody who's lived there and been there, will know that land is very unfertile. It's full of people who are nomads. Uh, the life is very suburban. It's very hard and harsh to live there, even now. There's a lot of sandstorms. The weather is harsh. So nobody really gave this area that much importance. So 
to claim that uh, he'd made khuruj against uh, the Ottoman uh, Empire is geographically and historically incorrect. Because, like we said before, there has never been a, a caliphate that was ruling over it. It was just tribal uh, villages or tribal warfare intermingling between people. And people were unfortunately killed. And this is why he came and he thought the dawah needs to be revived. There's a lot of shirk going on. And as we will see, the attitude of the people then was very, very bad. There's a lot of shirk going on, there's a lot of warfare going on, blood was being shed. There was no nidham, there was complete chaos. It was complete jahiliyyah. But at that time, the main people at that, in that area, the main tribe, were called Bani Khalid. Now this is very important, we have to remember this name, and it will come after as well. And they were situated in Al-Ahsa, which is on the right-hand side, or towards the east of, of, of Najd. And they had the most power and the most influence in this area. Now the thing is, when we talk about Najd, Usually the criticism that's labelled that Abdul Wahab or Sheikh Muhammad is that he was a Najdi. And there are some narrations which say that uh, the horns of Shaitan will rise from the west or from the east, sorry. There's another narration where the Prophet was on the member and he pointed towards the house of Aisha and that is towards the east. And he said the fitna will come from there. There's other narrations which say that uh, the Prophet made dua for different regions, Sham, Yemen. But he refused to make the for Najd. And they said, why? And he said, this is where the horns of shaitan will come. And this is where uh, the fitna will arise from. So unfortunately, those who level the attack at Abdul Wahab use these hadith. And they say that, look, this man is a shaitan. The Prophet ﷺ told us that he will come with this fitna. But then how can we refute this? I mean, how, it's obviously irrational to believe that the man who is calling to Kitab and Sunnah is... Uh, shaitan, or he's creating some kind of fitna. Uh, what we can say, there, there are several ways that we can refute this claim. The first one is that Khattabi mentions, and this has been mentioned by Ibn Hajar in uh, Fatul Dari as well, that Najd uh, linguistically means a high place. Najd linguistically means high place. So any area can have its own Najd. Even Hijaz can have its own Najd. Sham can have its own Najd. So Najd here is referring to somewhere, somewhere which has a high place, an elevated place above you know, uh, the other regions. But the explanation, now the thing is now, when we're making a claim, when we're looking at a hadith or we're looking at an ayah, it's very important that we take the, the understanding from the ulama, obviously. So now if they are saying that this hadith or these narrations are talking about Abdul Wahab, we will clearly say to them quite openly and honestly, where is the proof for your statement? I mean... Where is your understanding coming from? Because now we will see that there are many kibar from Ahl Sunnah as well as Ahl Hadith and the Fuqaha have all agreed that this doesn't refer to Abdul Wahab. As in, they didn't explicitly say it, but they didn't need to. And we will see why. For example, Imam al we said that these Ahadith refer to the fitna of the Dajjal. And there's another narration that the Prophet is recorded by uh, Imam Ahmad in his Musnad that the Prophet said that Dajjal will arise from Asfahan. And that's in the east. And this is Iran today. And he said he will be supported by an army of, uh, of the Yahud. And he will rise from amongst the Khawarij. Now, if you look at the demographics that we're living in today, this is particularly interesting. He will come from Asfahan, which is an area that's still called Asfahan today in Iran. And he will be supported by the Yahud. And he will rise amongst... The Khawarij, where are the Khawarij, where are Daesh today? Within this region, undoubtedly. I mean, I don't want to get into politics, I don't want to get into conspiracy theories, but this is what Nawi said about the hadith that he refers to at Dajjal. Ibn Hajar said that the, the explanation of, the, of these hadith is referring to direction. Because if you put all the hadith together, the, the Quran of Shaitan will come from the uh, from the east and all these different narrations put it together and I mean Hajar is saying that it's the direction that he's talking about he didn't specify a place one of the imma of the salaf Abu Hatim al-Razi said it refers to Musaylima where did Musaylima come from? this area in Najd uh, Thumam and his fitna was there and he was a Kadib and he was a Dajjal and he was a Shaitan and this is particularly interesting now Alusi the famous Mufassir, said that it refers to the fitna that happened with Ali. Now, why is this interesting? Because for me, it's inconceivable to say that this hadith, or these are hadith, refer to Abdul Wahab. Why? Oh, Sheikh Muhammad. 
Because we have the, the, the death of the Prophet, or the Hijrah of the Prophet وسلم, which is the first year of Hijrah, until the coming of Abdul Wahhab is 1100 years. So we're saying in that gap, there's been no fitna in that region. And there's no uh, you know, calls to da'wah towards shaitan or something which is not orthodox Islam. And that we had an 1100-year gap, and now these hadith refer to Abdul Wahhab. When we had Musaylimah, when we had the fitna of Ali, when we had the fitna of Hussein, all in this region. All in this region. So how is it conceivable to say that this is now particularly talking about Sheikh Muhammad, it doesn't make sense. So this is what Ali uh, Alusi is saying. He didn't refer to uh, Abdul Wahab, obviously, but he said that it refers to the fitna that happened in Iraq uh, and the fitna that uh, happened to Ali and Hussein and, and, and the Karabal issue and all of that thing that happened afterwards. So now the point here is, uh, which of the ulama have said it refers to Abdul Wahab? Like I said, there's 1100 gap. Pick one scholar, even until today, from somebody who is respected on an international scale, not somebody who is within the Sufi community, you know, where's your evidence for this? And even if he makes that claim, where is his evidence? Because we all know that the statement of everybody is accepted or rejected, except for the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu So even if somebody, if they do find someone, we have to look at it holistically. But there are others from the scholars, now this is even more interesting, that they said that it refers to Dajjal because the horns of the rising of the shaitan, or it refers to shaitan because the horns... Of the rising, the Prophet ﷺ said that the horns of Shaitan will rise from the east. So they said this is haqiqi, this is literal, this is factual. How can we change the interpretation of the Prophet or the wording of the Prophet ﷺ to have a metaphorical meaning? So they said that the the the, the, the Prophet ﷺ said that the, the horns rise from the east. Khalas is referring to Shaitan. It's not referring to anybody else. So this is again, you know, something which is uh, interesting because if you look at it linguistically, if you look at it uh, for what it stands for, then it, it can only refer to shaitan or dajjal or, uh, or anything which has come within the narrations without <coughs> any kind of ta'wil, without any kind of, you know, far-fetched interpretation. Also, in order to um, look at this hadith or look at the, you know, this claim of theirs, we have to also realize that Abdul Wahhab was from Banu Tamim, and it's been narrated in Bukhari that the Prophet said that uh, Banu Tamim will be the harshest against a Dajjal. So, how can he be from the Dajjal? How can he be a Shaitan when he has been explicitly said that this tribe are going to be from the harshest of the Dajjal? Clearly, obviously, we can't, we can't contradict ourselves and say that this hadith of the Prophet is referring to uh, Abdul Wahhab because we can't say that. We don't know that for certain. And we will see that there's another principle when it comes to this in a short while. But we can see that the signs are quite clear. You know, Banu Tamim, he's calling to Kitab, he's calling to Sunnah, he's not calling to Shirk, he's not calling to Fitna, he's calling to respect, he's calling to unity. I mean, it's far-fetched for you to now to claim that this, uh, these hadith refer to uh, Sheikh Muhammad. And this, is, this leads on to the next point, that the scholars like Imam Nawi, in, uh, in his Sharaf Muslim, has clearly st- said that when it comes to the Alamat al Sa'a or the Ashrat al Sa'a, then we cannot specify a time or a place. So if the Prophet ﷺ said that the Bedouins will start building tall buildings, and then you know it's the time of judgment, or the woman will give, the slave woman will give uh, birth to her master, or the Prophet ﷺ said there will be a lot of killing, and this is a sign of their judgment. How do we know? which generation this falls into. Killing has happened. If you go back 800 years, Baghdad was described as flowing in blood. So what, did they turn around and say that this is the Ashraf Sa'a, this is what the Prophet said? So nobody can say specifically that this is what's happening. And the scholars have said that this is Khabariya, not, uh, not that there's a ruling that is connected to it. So some of the scholars even said that it's permissible for you to uh, build tall buildings. That's not the intent by the Prophet Wasallam. He's just saying that this is what's going to happen. So my point here is for us to specify uh, something that is going to happen uh, towards the end of time and specify it to Abdul Wahab, then nobody can say that. For certain. This, is the, this is the point uh, that we're making here. Also, uh, there's a narration where uh, Salman uh, al-Farasi was called to leave Iraq and go to live in, uh, in uh, Sham at that time, Abu Darda. 
And Salman said that it's not the place that you live in, as in if you come here you'll be Mubarak. <coughs> Salman said you will, it's not the place that defines your level of piety. It's not the place that ref- defines it. And this is well known. I mean, you go to Makkah, you find drug dealers there, you find the most worst of people. But you come to Leicester, you find good people. So it's not the place that defines you. So this is the point here. The point here is that just because he was from Najd, does it mean, or just because he's from that area that the Prophet wasallam, even if we say for argument's sake that he's talking about Najd, we cannot explicitly say that this refers to Sheikh Muhammad. Because places don't define the person's level of piety or wickedness. Uh, also, there's another narration that is agreed upon. The Prophet ﷺ said that there will be fitna that, are come, that will come from Medina. And the fitna will fall in Medina like Qatratul Ma, like water falling upon, upon you. It will come down quite heavily. And this will happen in Medina. So if we're going to say that this, these hadiths refer to Najd, then what are we going to say about Medina? The point here is we cannot specify. We cannot specify and we cannot attribute Haq and Batil to a particular place. We have to look at the sifat or the attributes of the person. Um, moving on with the seerah of uh, Sheikh Muhammad. The society at the time of Sheikh Muhammad. Now, like I say, it's very important to understand how society was so that we can get benefits from it, but also so we can see what he had to deal with and the, the lessons that we learned from his dawah, as in what, what was dawah actually about. If we look at society, then we can see, and the scholars say this a lot, that we can see the difference between Haq and Batil when we compare them with each other. So uh, the historians of Najd, and these are quite well known, they were very impartial when they collected uh, uh, Najd history. Uh, these are well, quite famous uh, historians of Najd. One is called uh, Abdul Muhsin bin Baz. Another one is called Ibn Bishr. Another one is called uh, Muhammad Uthaymeen, uh, Abdullah Uthaymeen, the brother of Muhammad Uthaymeen, uh, the Sheikh. And there's another man called Ibn Ghanam. Now, this is quite interesting now. They've all said in different ways that the society at that time was, A, obviously quite well known to us, full of shirk, people worshipping graves. Uh, some people were actually atheists at that time as well. Some people believed at that time that they didn't need an organization in Sharia. They were happy with their tribalism, they were happy with their you know, level of warfare with each other. But this might, you know, what I'm going to say now might shock you a bit more. Uh, in Mecca, Azizia was a block for prostitution. Anybody been to Mecca would know. Uh, it's quite fi- a famous place now. People go there for Hajj and even now the hotels are being pushed back. Azizia was a block for brothels. This is documented in Najd history. Alcohol in both the Haramain was rife and open. Rife and open. And there was an, an account where they said that Masjid al Nabawi was shut for 40 days. Nobody prayed in it. 40 days. Masjid al Nabawi was shut. And alcohol was rife. And prostitution was rife. Homosexuality was also rampant. And one of the accounts of the historian said that this was happening at Mam al Kab. The haram is there. Right outside the haram, you will find homosexuality, you find prostitution, you find alcohol. This is the society that they were living in. This is added to the fact that like we were saying there was shirk, people were worshipping the graves. And some people just didn't want religion, they didn't feel that they needed religion. Atheists. Um, one of the historians said, like I said, they were, they were impartial, but they did say in one of the accounts that um, the Ottomans, when they fought Sheikh Muhammad later on, and we'll see this in Syria, uh, when they fought Sheikh Muhammad, some of the Ottomans had been documented as not praying Salah. Within the army, they didn't pray. And some of them, yeah, they were atheists, and some of them, didn't, they didn't pray. Meaning, you know, they had these two characteristics. They were atheists and they didn't pray. These are the people opposing Sheikh Muhammad. But on the flip side, what does Sheikh Muhammad stand for? He stood for Tawheed and he stood for establishing the Salah. So you can see the comparison here. This is one of the things that have been documented. So they're saying it's interesting to say that, look, you know, these people are against him. They're cl- claiming that he's a rebel. He wants political power. But uh, the reality of the situation is that some of the Ottomans, they, you know, they, used, they abused their power, they used 
you know, the authority that they had, even the Haramain, to indulge themselves in major sins, eradicate any form of la ilaha illallah and complete become atheists, as well as not obviously not establishing the salah. And this is in the Haramain, this is in Makkah and Medin. Uh, also, society, Sufism was rampant, shirk and bid'ah was out of control. The masses believed in fortune telling, they believed in, uh, they were heavily indulged in music and alcohol and drugs and tobacco as well at that time. Tobacco abuse was very rampant and sihr. Um, when Mus- well, obviously, uh, it wasn't that the haram was completely shut, it's the salah was still being established. Even in Medina, like I said, there was a, a time gap where they said that you know it was shut. But uh, we all know that the, the haram was completely split. We had the mahrab for the Hanafis and the mahrab for the Shafis. And they completely dis- disunited, the Malikis and the Hanbalis. Complete different imams. And each imam would sit in his place and they will give the fatwa according to that madhab. So if you were Hanafi, you'd go to the Hanafi imam and he would give you the Hanafi ruling. Not concerned about kitab and sunnah. Just the Hanafi ruling. And we will see now, later on, why that is, why that was the case. Because in society at that time, there were scholars, but they didn't get involved with politics. They didn't want to challenge the idea of shirk and the Ottomans. And some of the scholars gave different reasons why. Um, and also, we will see the evil effects of not understanding fiqh and not understanding, uh, you know, the, the effects of ta'asub and having, you know, Partisanship towards your mother But this was the case This is just to clearly say That this is how society was at that time uh, And Nadwi said that Turkish uh, Replaced Arabic in some places uh, Particularly in Najd The Bedouins um, Like we said They were having shirk And they worshipped the jinn um, There were judges there at that time, they had ulama at that time, but like I said, they weren't uh, paying attention to aqeelah at all. It was strictly fiqh. It was strictly fiqh at that time. And it was humbly fiqh as well at that time, in Najd. Um, going on to the scholars, like we were saying, um, they were scholars, but some of the scholars said, you know, what was the reason for you know, the lack of da'wah that was going on? Abdul Wahab obviously started learning, and he came from a knowledge based background. His father was a scholar and he learned Quran at a very early age. So when he became, and he was very rich as well, his family were very rich, so he was able to travel a lot and study. So when he was studying, he found that the ulama there were very stagnant, they were very dormant, they weren't doing anything. So the, some of the scholars said that, you know, what is the explanation for this? So some of them said that the scholars weren't actually scholars at that time, they were just judges placed at that time. And they would give the ruling as and when. They weren't considered. They weren't considered as being mujtahid. They weren't. Their concern wasn't for uh, any, any kind of revival or any kind of. It was just status quo. You come to me and I'll give you the the fatwa and khalas. Some of them say they weren't scholars. They were actually ignorant. Some of them said that they were scared of any kind of you know rebuke if they were getting imprisoned. And other people said that some of them were paid off. So these are the four different interpretations found by you know, some of the historians and the scholars in reference to the, the ulama that were there. And someone might ask and say, you know, what is happening you know, at that time in society? Were there no scholars? Were there no people of khair? But they were. <coughs> now, if you look at the situation that we're living in now, we have to remember, you know, there's alcohol, there's sihr, there's, and there's scholars outside as well, nobody's really talking. You know, the situation hasn't really changed much, or maybe we've gone backwards. And maybe it did change. There was a period where you know the da'wah of uh, Sheikh Muhammad really took off after his death, and then that was then incorporated by the scholars that came afterwards, Abdul uh, Abdul Rahman Al Saadi, and then after him Baz and Umbani. And there was a time, the seventies and eighties, where people would say that you know the da'wah was really booming, and there was a lot of khair that was coming out. You know, books were being published. Uh, I remember one sheikh in in Riyadh. He said that before. Uh, Ali Saud had their complex for printing books. The books of Ibn Taymiyyah were not known. Some of them, until now, are not being found. So you can look at the khair that's come out of the da'wah of Sheikh Muhammad. I mean, the massages are full of musahif. There's musahifs there. 
think every single one of us has been affected by the Hadaw of Sheikh Muhammad and the efforts of uh, any, the Saudi government from the beginning until now. I don't think there's any country that hasn't been affected by it. But the point is, the society that we're living in, in a broader sense, I think maybe even globally, is more or less what he went through. So now, for people to say, oh, well, how can we get change? You know, what is there we, that we can do? The role model is here for us. And the first thing that we have to concentrate is clearly on Tawheed and getting that connection with Allah in, in our worship. So the scholars were weak and the masses, they didn't really care. Some of the scholars shied away. And like we said, the, the only way that you can ever get reform is through ikhlas and having tawakkul and doing good deeds Sorting yourself out within yourself And like we said Allah will put barakah in it If it's going to be accepted from you And this is an alama for yourself A sign for yourself And a sign for society as well So uh, who is Sheikh Muhammad? Sheikh Muhammad like we said Comes from a, scholar, uh, a scholarly background He's from Banu Tamim His father was Suleiman ibn Ali he was a, His grandfather was a judge He memorized Quran at a very early age And like we said he was rich And he, he began to study And he began to travel uh, some of them said that he based his uh, early understanding on the Hanbali fiqh And then afterwards he was uh, affected uh, positively by the books of Sheikh uh, Ibn Taymiyyah And uh, Sheikh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, Sheikh uh, Islam Ibn Qayyim He began studying with his father, then he went to Uyayna Then he travelled to Mecca and the Medina He became firm in knowledge, he went to Basra And then he came back to Ahsa And Ahsa at that time was the bed of knowledge at that time So he travelled, he clearly travelled uh, so this kind of refutes the idea that his family were against him. His, his father and grandfather were his teachers. And some of the Orientalists say that he only travelled so that he can spread the idea of revolution and then he can get married and he can fulfil his desires with having multiple wives. This is what some of the claims are from the universities here in the West. Abdul Wahab, Sheikh Muhammad, just wanted power. He travelled to these different places he got ulama and from different places, like for example in Medina, he had scholars from different backgrounds. And the only reason was to get some kind of revolution going. This, was, this is their claim. But this doesn't correlate. Why doesn't it correlate? Because if he was, uh, he travelled when he was young, and this is well documented. So if he travelled when he was young, it doesn't correlate chron chronolo chronologically with the fall of the Ottoman Empire. See what I'm saying? So I mean, if they say that he only travelled for the sake of power, he travelled when he was young. He travelled when he was young. This is documented. But the Ottoman Empire fell after he got older and towards his death. And there was a lot of friction, as we will see, between Dariya and the Ottoman Empire. So how does that fit in? I mean, if he travelled when he was old, then he wouldn't have made it back. He would have died a lot. Uh, he would have drive, died while he was travelling. The point is, 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 is a claim that's made from the Orientalists and, uh, and it's completely baseless. So this was his fiqh, this is what he did. Now this is very important for us now uh, to understand fiqh and to understand, you know, how do we prioritize fiqh. Now, going back to recent history, if you go back to maybe the 70s or maybe even the 60s, immigration came from India and Pakistan to this country here and they brought with them the Hanafi mother. Now, understand that the Hanafi Madhab wasn't uh, you know, the, the law of the land, as it typically would be in a Muslim country. But when other immigration happened from different uh, backgrounds and the Salafis came in, for me, I feel, this is strictly me speaking, and I see this is coming from his, uh, his seerah also, that uh, there was a lot of intolerance when it comes to fiqh. So you find somebody who's on a Hanafi madhab, who's on a legitimate madhab, and this is what uh, Sheikh al-Islam protected and respected, even though he didn't completely follow the madhab. He was a mujtahid and he followed the Quran and the Sunnah. When he, when he was in line with the madhab, he followed it. When he didn't, then he would leave the, his madhab. But the point here is, when he knew that the people in his society were following the Hanabi, Hanbali madhab, he didn't rebuke them. And he didn't ridicule them. And he wasn't harsh against them. And in some instances, this is well documented with the scholars, like Ibn Taymiyyah talks about it at length, Mujmul Fatawa, he said that Turk al-Mustahab, Mustahab, for the sake of unity. Leaving something Mustahab 
is good and recommended mustahab for the sake of unity. And an example that I, I found in Riyadh, one mashaykh, he, he was asked, if I go to Hanafi mas- Masjid in the West, if I raise my hands in Salah or I say Ameen out loud, there could be a lot of backlash. There could be a lot of fitna. And Leicester, alhamdulillah, is okay. I mean, even the different massages in Leicester, they kind of tolerate one another because we're quite multicultural. But if you go to a different city, especially if you're praying in a Sufi masjid, you raise your hands, you say, I mean, out loud. I've even seen it here in Leicester. You know, you could get a lot of problems, sometimes even physical. So the point here is, I'm not trying to say that you leave following the Quran and Sunnah. That's not the point. The point here is we have to use hikmah when it comes to difference of opinion, when it comes to fiqh. And one of the things that the scholars have said in the books of Usul is when you go to a land, you have to know the fiqh of the people that they are dealing with. Now this is of two types. The fiqh of the people, <coughs> if it's something which is connected to the, uh, the, the, the general masses and the, and the customs of that people, then we have to look, look at some kind of tolerance. If it's not connected to their customs, then there is no tolerance. Let me give you an example. Now, if somebody comes to you and says, uh, in my religion I can do shirk, and this is because the Mawlana told me to do it. This is not connected to the customs, this is connected to directly going against the Kitab and Sunnah, then we cannot tolerate this. But if somebody says, okay, my Mawlana told me to pray in this particular way, and customarily this is what we have been accustomed to, then we will say, okay, especially if it's not the priority. Especially if it's not the priority. Because the scholars have said here, for the, key, for the sake of keeping unity, we need to use hikmah. So if you go to speak to somebody who doesn't know what he's talking about, he just knows what his mulan has told him, and you say to him, well, your mulan is wrong, your books are wrong, your masjid is wrong, everything you're doing is wrong. I mean, where's the hikmah in that? And if you look at the, the life of uh, Sheikh Muhammad, Shirk was his priority. I mean, he saw a lot of munkar in society, including in the religion, including in the masajid. But he didn't make inkar of it. He used hikmah and he placed the thing according to uh, its priority. And he prioritized his da'wah. But the problem is now, is now we will see also in his seerah, that, uh, and, the th- and what we find today as well, unfortunately, is that people follow their madhab, and they stick to it as it being and believing it that is the haq. And there's no way out of it. And unfortunately, we find this within Salafia as well. How many times do you find somebody saying that, okay, uh, you know, this is your opinion, but I completely ignore the other opinion from Ahl Sunnah also. Another example I can give you is, um, I don't want to be controversial here, but maybe like feet to feet. When you're standing in Salaf, feet to feet. Some people, I've been to some massages, they are very, very strict to me. Very strict on it, to the extent that they will step on your foot, not put your foot next to their foot. They will literally step on your foot. And I've had this before, where the person is literally stamping on my foot to make sure that his foot is on top of my foot throughout the Salah. And it didn't stop there. His shoulder was in my armpit. (laughs) And one brother, he actually got angry on my behalf. Because this guy, I literally had to pray like this. There's no room for manoeuvre. Now the point here is that, okay, I mean, you're trying to do something which is good, but A, you're not implementing it correctly. But secondly, if somebody doesn't hold that opinion, don't force your opinion upon him. There is leeway in this. Bin Baz, okay, he was with Albani in this, but Uthaymeen, if you find a lot of the kibar today, and I've prayed alongside and with the likes of Sheikh Salah Fawzan, Sheikh Salah said that, Allah Yerham. Uh, Sheikh uh, Al Hidan many times next to him, uh, and our Sheikh Sheikh Salah Shithri, and many other ulama <coughs> kibar, they don't pray in this way. My point is that there's leeway. I mean, there's a difference of opinion, but the moment you start enforcing it, what does it become? It becomes like you know this sense of rigidness, and this is exactly what we blame them for. When you go to the masjid, you can't pray in this particular way, or you have to do this, or you. So this is ta'assub. It can become ta'assub. And this is just an example. In fact, you can find many examples within Salafiyya where there is ta'assub. So you, you ask a shaykh, okay, shaykh, I'm listening to this man. Shall I listen to this man? Is he from Ahl sunnah Is he a scholar? The shaykh will say yes. But another person from Ahl sunnah will say, no, don't listen to him. He's a hizbi or he's got some kind of bid'ah or something like this. He is acting on his ijtihad and he is acting on his ijtihad. 
if you force your ijtihad upon him, what happens? It becomes a madhab. It becomes partisanship. It becomes rigidness. And all this creates a splitting. All this creates a splitting. And sometimes it even goes to the extreme that people... Because it creates splitting because now this Salafi will not pray with this Salafi. Or this Salafi will not talk to this Salafi because of what's going on. Or this Hanafi will not pray or enter the masjid of this Salafi. What's happening? The lack of respect for scholarly ijtihad. It's not our job to say what is right and what is wrong. And this is one of the things that the scholars have said that for us people, lay people, we make knuckle. We make knuckle of the fatwa. So if I ask your opinion, brother, have you seen, what is the ruling on X, Y, and Z? You say, I'm not a scholar, you can't ask me. But I have heard Sheikh Albani say this, and this is the opinion that I follow because I think this is the correct opinion. This is what we do. We just follow what the scholars have told us to do because we are not in the position of ishtihad. If you can decipher between what is right and wrong, this is a different issue. But my point here is, is when we start saying that this is the fatwa that I'm following, but this is the fatwa that I'm following, and we make an issue of differing, then what happens? People just end up splitting. And this is what they've done. Some of the Hanafis said you can't, some of the Shafis said that you can marry the people of, uh, of the Hanafi madhab because they resemble the people of the book. They resemble the people of the book. I understand. Sometimes, so historically, blood was shed between the Hanafis and the Shafis. So it leads to splitting in the Ummah. When you don't uh, tolerate ijtihad, and the extreme in this, and we find this within Salafi today, is people, they won't say this, but they will, the, 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 the actions are, are quite clear, they will believe that this scholar has become infallible. Anything he says is haqq. His ijtihad is qat'i. His ijtihad is qat'i. What does this mean? His ijtihad is definite. It's not that his ijtihad is, could be right, could be wrong. It's cut just like the nas. So now if you pick up an ayah, we'll say this ayah is qat'i. It's definite. There's no way of saying that this ayah could be right, could be wrong. His ijtihad now has become qat'i. Just like what they did with the Hanafis, just like what the Hanafis did with the Hanaf- Abu Hanifa, and what the Shafis did with Umar the Dris, etc. So now like I say, this is found within Salafiyyah today. When it comes to even fiqh, when it even comes to a messiah, what they call as manhaj, uh, and it's just creating fitna. And like we said, Sheikh Muhammad realized that this, this is the kind of mentality that he is dealing with. And when he began to give his dawah, all he focused on, on was tawheed. Now, if you look at uh, some of his books, his early books, Masa al Jahiliya, uh, Kitab al Tawheed. Uh, all of these books, it's just concentrating on aqidah and manhaj. And when I say manhaj, going back to the Quran and the Sunnah. And a lot of the stuff that you will find is not from himself. It's as if he's copied and pasted. For example, a lot of the stuff when it comes to Masa al Jahiliya, I don't know if you've read this book, he's, it's about 180 points on how Jahiliya, at the time of the Prophet, وسلم, or before the coming of the Prophet, وسلم, is still relevant in the Ummah today. Splitting and shirk and. Uh, doing taqlid of your, of your forefathers, uh, women not getting their rights, all these different things that were in Jahiliya at the time of the Prophet <coughs> the same things that he came to eradicate are still in the Ummah. <coughs> and some of these things he got from the famous Mufassir At-Tabari. Uh, I don't know if you've read the beginning of Wabil Sayyib, it's exactly the same as Qawad al-Arba. Uh, in Wabil Sayyib, Ibn Qayyim says that the the keys for success and happiness in the dunya is to make istighfar when you make a, a mistake, when you're giving, uh, when you're giving a, a favor, you make shukr, and when you are faced with the test, you make sabr. Your affair is one of these three: istighfar, shukr, or sabr. You do this, then khalas, you're happy with your Lord. There's no affair out of these three in your life that will be out of these three. This is a ni'mah right now, we make shukr of Allah. If something happens to you afterwards, you make sabr. If you fall into a sin, khalas, istighfar. So I mean, this is the thing, this is what he focused on, he focused on tawheed and he focused on aqeedah and manhaj. He knew that there were issues when fiqh, but he knew that if he focuses on aqeedah and manhaj, the fiqh will sort itself out. Society will sort itself out. The shahawat and the shubahat will sort themselves out. Uh, and this is a nukta here that some of the scholars also said that he wasn't actually Shaykh al-Islam when they said that he wasn't holistic. 
in knowing all the disciplines of, uh, of the Sharia. Uh, if you pick up a book of Ibn Taymiyyah, especially Mujmu al Fatawa, you will find all the disciplines in there. I don't think there's anything in there that he hasn't dealt with. Even stuff that are outside the Sharia, like Mantuk philosophy, he's talked about it. And he's talked about it within an Islamic context. So I was actually listening uh, to Nur al Darb in Riyadh, and somebody asked Sheikh Abdul Karim this question. He said, Sheikh Abdul Karim Khuler, he asked, they asked this question. They said, uh, how can we call him Sheikh al-Islam when his knowledge wasn't known to be that vast? And the answer was is that he wasn't so strong in other areas, but the effect that he had from Aqeed and Manhaj was profound. And because of this, he was the Mujaddid of his time. So this clearly shows that it's not about having volumes of books. It's about doing the right thing. And this starts with your connection with Allah. Having Tawheed and seeking Allah and following the Messenger, alayhi salam. You do this, then khalas, everything will fall into place. When it comes to the, the, the angle of shubuhat, doubts in your aqidah, and inshallah we will talk about this in detail. And shahawat, when it comes to things that you want to do, that your desires are telling you to do, but... You know, sometimes you fall, sometimes you make a mistake, sometimes it's an ongoing battle. Right, so this is how society was. Politically, uh, he had issues with the Shia in Basra. Uh, he, had, uh, he went to Ahsa, like we said, and that was the, the bedrock of knowledge at that time. He also studied in uh, Huraymila, and he wrote Kitab at at the age of 38. So he had studied, he travelled. Once he settled, 30 years old, he wrote Kitab al-Tawheed. It shows you his level of knowledge and his level of maturity. He then went to uh, Uyayna, and the Amir of Uyayna at that time was a man called Uthman ibn Mu'ammar. And he liked his da'wah. And he said, this is exactly what we want. So he supported him. And he got him married to his auntie so that there was a, a connection between the families. So now he had a political presence or support in this area. So there was a grave, and this is one of the first things that he did when he gained this political support. There was a grave of Zayd al-Khattab, Umar al-Khattab's brother, radiallahu And people used to go to his grave in Jubail, which is on the east coast of Saudi Arabia today. Uh, and they used to worship the grave. You know, they used to ask it, you know, make dua to it, intercession... Uh, etc and he went there and he destroyed the, the tomb that was there and uh, like we said Uthman liked him a lot and he became the Qadi and he moved up the hierarchy quite quickly and he was able to fuse religion and politics now so now if you look at even the time of the Prophet Sallallahu the Dawah was just about Tawheed people used to come to Mecca for Hajj and he used to make da'wah. Abu Jahl knew that this was the time. This time is pivotal. If somebody gives Muhammad his ear, khalas, we are finished as Quraysh. He knew this. So he used to stand at Mina and he used to go to these different masha'ir, not for the sake of Allah to perform the Hajj, but to warn against Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And he used to say, he's a madman, don't listen to him. A group from the Ansar came and they said, who is this man that they are talking about? What, why is he so controversial in Makkah? So they went to him and they said to him, What is your da'wah? And he told them, Da'wah is la ilaha illallah. Why do we need to worship these idols? Allah is your creator and he deserves your worship. Nothing else. Quite clear. So they gave him bay'ah. And this is known as uh, uh, the, the first allegiance. And there was only six of them. They went back to Medina and the Prophet ﷺ said, Give da'wah to your people. I don't want anything else. Just give da'wah to your people. And this is how they got known as the Ansar. They supported the Prophet uh, in, uh, in, in Aqeedah as well as physically. So then when the next Hajj came, there were 73, I think, 70 uh, odd number. And this is the second allegiance. Now they said, Khalas, come to us. We will support you. And this was the political situation for the Prophet ﷺ. because before that uh, his uncle Abu Talib was protecting him on a political level socially he was giving da'wah emotionally he was being protected by Khadija politically he was uh, 
secured or safe but from Abu Talib. In one year, Abu Talib passed away and a few days later, his wife passed away. SubhanAllah. So this is known as the year of grievance. And then after that, he went to Ta'if to seek this protection. He's very insecure in Makkah right now. He, his uncle passed away. He's one of the chiefs of the Quraysh. He's got his back. He's passed away. Who's going to protect us now? We are a small number of Muslims. Uh, some of us come from poor backgrounds and we have no protection whatsoever. I need to get something. So he went to Ta'if. And Ta'if, as you know, completely shunned him. So now he needs some kind of support. So this is exactly what happened here. And uh, the support came from Medina and then they said, the exact same thing happened here. He moved up the hierarchy through having Tawheed. And political stability came this way. Unfortunately, right now, people are looking at the opposite. They're looking at going out there and refuting the ideologies that are faced against the Ummah today when it comes to atheism, when it comes to anything. Sexuality, when it comes to uh, feminism, women's rights. They're looking at ways to ref- or to looking at ways to refute claims against Islam based on their own principles. Based on their own principles, but why would you need to do that when we have the objective truth? We have the truth which is completely clear. So what they are doing is they are turning it upside down rather than basing it upon Tawheed, looking at the Kitab and Sunnah and looking at how their ideologies or their perception of Islam is false. So this is what the Sheikh did. But unfortunately, like we said before, the big uh, superpower or the super tribe at that time were known as Banu Khalid. And Banu Khalid, they didn't like his dawah. So they forced the ruler, Uthman Muammar, to exa- uh, exile Sheikh Muhammad. He was forced to leave. So he went to Dariya. However, alhamdulillah, from the virtue of Allah, the athar or the effects of the dawah remained. Uh, uh, where he was uh, and Jubail and Ra'ina and all these other areas had a love for Tawheed and a love for the Sheikh even though they exiled him even though they threw him out of their city but he went to Dariya and now the scholars have said that when you are giving uh, uh, da'wah uh, you have to use knowledge and look at the life of the Prophet, uh, Prophet as well as Sheikh Muhammad knowledge, wisdom knowing how to deal with your people and one of the benefits that uh, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh al-Islam uh, Ibn Taymiyyah said that if you look at the se- first wahi that came down was Iqra. Iqra, bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Gain knowledge. Iqra wa rabbika al-akram alladhi alam al-kalam. And then the second one that came down was Ya ayyuhal muddathir. So the first one is gain knowledge. Qum fa'anthir wa rabbaka fa'kabbir. Gain in ibadah. Knowledge. Ibada, Warruj Fahjur, until Allah says, Rabbika uh, Fasbir. So now we can see that Ibn Taymiyyah, how he, from his wisdom and, and, and knowledge that Allah gave to him, Allah have mercy on him, look at the order of Wahi that came to the Prophet. He said, This is the hikmah behind the order knowledge, Ibada, purifying yourself from internal and external ridges and have sabr in Allah. And all of the shuroot here of giving da'wah are found within this context. So this is exactly what he did. This is exactly what he did. And the purpose uh, he realized was to create unity upon Tawheed. Because Allah says, فَاعْتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا حَبْلِ اللَّهِ is the rope of Allah. Be united upon it. So he called also the people to be balanced in the dunya and the akhirah. He's calling them for rectification of their hearts. Not just Tawheed. Tawheed, he wasn't just saying Tawheed, Tawheed, Tawheed. He was calling them to think about their lives. Obviously this is Tawheed, but in an indirect manner. Uh, he was telling them uh, to fear Allah, to say that, you know, the propagation uh, or prosper- prosperity sorry, is only through following the religion properly. And it was narrated that he was very rarely harsh with his people, even though with what was going on, it was very rarely harsh. And this is what the scholars have said, that this is the asal, that you only use harshness when you're trying to correct, or when you're trying to enjoy good or forbid evil, only if there's a maslaha behind it. Unfortunately, it's become the default for some of the people. I'm not just talking about Salafis. When we say that harshness 
immediately people think about the Salafis, but even if you look at some of the different sects, they're very harsh by default. If you don't go to Tabliq, what happens? Straight away you are shunned, straight away you are seen as a, an outsider. But this is not the hikmah, this is not how it was. And uh, the scholars have said the asal is that we use leniency, we use wisdom and we use sabr. And this is the aspect of his life of, of giving da'wah. So then he moved to Dariya. And here al Saud gave him support. They said, look, we will, we will support you. Uthman doesn't want you, Mu'ammar. You're under pressure from Bani Khalid, but Bani Khalid can't do anything to us. We're al Saud. We, we've got power. But we will take you. But we will only take you on a condition. That you sign a covenant that you are with us. That you won't leave us. That you stay with us. And he agreed to this. And at that time, what happened was, Ibn Saud, what they did is they started intermingling their marriages. And it still continues until today. So that each tribe can help one another and none of them would see each other as a mitzvah. They're together, not misfits. Uh, some of the historians have said that there's also a benefit here that Ibn Saud at that time, or the Ali Saud at that time in Dariya, they were collecting tax from people. Now, something that we know from the Sharia, that tax is not something which is legislated in the deen of Islam. But again, uh, he remained silent for the greater benefit. And he said, let's leave this for now and let's focus on uh, what's happening uh, around us. Um, again, the idea here is not for the Sheikh to get involved with pre- politics. Uh, and what he did was he bonded society by modelling what the Prophet ﷺ did with the Ansar and the Mahajirun. So his idea wasn't that we get into class. I'm with Allah Saud, that's it, I'm on a... On a on a level here, nobody can touch me. It wasn't like that. What he did in Dariya, when he moved there, he made a khah. So basically, just like the Prophet ﷺ got the Ansar and told them that you need to adopt a brother from the Muhajirun, he did the same thing in Dariya. Because you have to remember, when he was leaving, Uyayna, people came with him. And then what happened was, uh, it became uh, a fortress of knowledge, Dariya. People were coming from outside to study. And the Shaykh had given him bay'ah, but guess what happened? Uthman, Mu'ammar, came back to uh, Shaykh Muhammad and said, come back. I want you to come back. Because I can see the barakah when you were there. But he said, come on, now I've got a covenant now. I'm sorry. So this clearly shows that, you know, everything you go through, every step of your life, like we said, we have forgiveness when you make a mistake. Shukr, when Allah gives you a favor. And sabr. He was dejected by his people, he was in exile, but look what Allah replaced him. Um, at this stage, he wasn't political, like we said, but what he started to do is he started sending out letters, just like what the Prophet ﷺ did to different tribal rulers. And he started uh, calling them to Tawheed, but what they did is returned back saying that you are a Khariji, you are making takfir. And like we said in Dura Saniya, he has a long statement, personal statement, I would call it, where he is saying that Mamunahaj is not about takfir. And in fact, he said, even if you find someone doing shirk, doing sujda to a, a qabar, you can't call him a kafir. You cannot call this person a kafir by default. There are conditions that need to be set down. And our manhaj is the manhaj of Ahl Sunnah and Quran and Sunnah. So what you have to do, there are steps to it. We're not takfiris. We're not going to say this. We've seen this person do this thing. Kalas. There's no excuse for him. He's outside. And also, in this Dura Saniya, he also said that I'm here not to eradicate the fiqh that you're upon or to, to, to get rid of the constitution of religion that you have. All I'm here to tell you is that you can't go to these graves and you can't worship the jinn and you can't go to these trees for the sake of, of worship. And... Obviously, Allah put barakah in his dawah, and he remained peaceful, but his power grew. People came, but his call was still being rejected, but people were still coming. Now, we have to remember at this stage, this is very important, because he had power and he had the ability to fight people, but he didn't fight people. If his dawah was just about killing, like Daesh say, and like even his enemies from the Sufis say, straight away he would have gone out, Khalas, I've got Allah Saud with me, let's go fight Bani Khal, let's go fight everyone. But he used hikmah. And what he did is he created a society. And he created a political balance. And he looked at socially and he looked at economically how we can 
uh, remove all the obstacles within our society. Let's grow internally before we go anywhere else. Let's remove the barriers of tribalism and uh, you know racial you know tensions that are there and the different tribalism. Let's just focus on ourselves. And this is what he did. And the year expanded and grew. And this is very important for us to now know that the, what these people say from Daesh and these people claim what Wahhabi is about is completely false. And one of the things that we know from Islam, the, some of the scholars have said, like Ibn Hajar, is that there's a difference between Qital and Muqatila. Linguistically, there's a difference between Qital and Muqatila. The Prophet, the Prophet وسلم, said, Umirtu an uqatilu nas hatta yashhadu la ilaha illallah. Until the end of the hadith. The Prophet وسلم, said, I've been commanded to fight the people. Qital. Not muqatila. Muqatila means genocide. So you can see that, you know, the wording seems very similar. But the, the idea here is that we strive against these people. Not necessarily physically. The idea here is not that we kill people. The idea here is that we spread kalima shahada la ilaha illallah. If we kill everyone, who's going to worship Allah? This is not what the Prophet did. And if you look at his life, that we're looking step by step. It, it resembles the seerah in many ways. But he had the chance to do it, but he didn't do it. And also, Ibn al-Qayyim uh, mention, mentions in uh, Madar al-Salikin, this is a very intricate benefit. He says, whenever something is mentioned in the Sharia, or aglabi, or, or, or a lot of the time, when something is legislated in Islam, but it's not the maqsood of the thing, it's not the reason why you're doing it. It has <clears throat> uh, an objective, an exte- uh, or, uh, end result, or it's something that Allah doesn't want from us, but because we have to do it to get the end result. The majhul is used. The majhul is used. Majhul means <coughs> the one who is commanding you has not been explicitly mentioned in the hadith or the ayah. So the Prophet wasallam said, Umirtu an uqatil nas Who is the one who commanded him? Allah, obviously. But did he say, Allah has commanded me to kill people or fight people? <coughs> Ibn al-Qayyim says here, when something is disliked in of itself, or if there's an, an external objective, the majhul is used. Look at this. So if Allah wanted us to kill people, he would have said it. And if it was something that was noble, he would have clearly said it. Allah loves for you to kill people. But this is not the objective. The objective is that we, we create iman in ourselves. How can you have uh, killing of people outside when you inside yourself are weak? I know last time I was in uh, Riyadh just a month ago and they were talking about having uh, protests. And I was speaking to a sheikh there and he goes, look at the shabab, look at the youth. At home they're sitting down on their phones, on Twitter. When they get hungry, they call for delivery. And delivery is rife there. I mean, over here you actually get up and go get your food. Over there you literally just call. Not even that, you can just press a click and the, your favorite restaurant will come to you. How on earth can these people claim that they want political reform when he's sitting on his phone, Twitter all day, ringing for burgers? This is the idea. This is the idea that people are talking about now as well with Daesh. It's the same concept, just in a different fashion. How can you get reform when you're going to kill people, but he's, he's full of shubahat and shahawat. He, he, his aqeerah is not salim. His uh, desires are dictating the way he, you know, the way he uh, sees the religion. So, I mean, the point is here that Allah doesn't want for us to kill people. And the majhul is used. And this is a, a benefit that Ibn Qayyim mentions in a, in a very nice way. And also, Allah says in the Quran, كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْكِتَالِ وَهُوَ قُرْهٌ لَكُمْ Allah has told you, kutiba again here, there's the majhul. The, 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 Allah says that uh, fighting has been prescribed for you. Who's prescribed it? Allah didn't say, I am telling you to go out there and fight. He didn't say that. Kutiba alaykum al qital. So, this is the point that Ibn, Ibn Qayyim was making. And the second thing Allah says in the Quran go and strive for the sake of Allah, even though you dislike it. Even though you dislike it. Even though you're fearing death. Even though that you don't want to get out of your city and you go to another city and. So the point here is that Islam has not come to tell us to go kill people. 
And it's not from the, uh, the, the, the characteristics or embedded characteristic of a Muslim to just go around creating fitna and, and kill people. And one of the things that you'll find with the, the kuffar here today, they'll say, why do you want to kill us all? What's going on with you guys? This kind of stuff. You hear this all the time. But this is not the point. Because Allah says in the Quran, He's commanding us to fight our own desires, to go fight for His sake. And this is the, the, the correct form of jihad. Let alone any kind of jihad which is not prescribed. Um, the society, the creed of society uh, that we see today also, we can see that um, was very much relevant in the time of uh, Sheikh Muhammad. Um, but there was still a very big idea of irja at that time, where they were saying that, okay, we have the deen, but maybe we don't need to enforce it on people, or maybe we don't need to give dawah to it, or maybe we don't need to be so harsh on people who are not establishing the religion. If they're doing shirk, let them do their shirk. You know, so they were, that was existent at that time also. But I mean, uh, obviously, Sheikh uh, Sheikh Muhammad didn't accept that. But if you look at the, the 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 situation of the Muslims today, within Salafi, without Salafi, and the reason why I'm saying Salafi is because we are meant to be the most purest and most uh, you know softest and most connected to Allah. How many find, how many times do you find people who are driven by sports or driven by music? Uh, or driven by things that are maybe not clear cut haram, but it's it's in it's it's become an indulgence which is taking over their lives. Sports, say it's mubah, it's, it's permissible for me to play football. The next step, let me start watching it. The next step, let me get a T-shirt. The next step, let me support a team. The next step, let me become infatuated by this footballer. And the list goes on. This is just sports. You can talk about anything else. You know, there's so many different things. You can talk about money. You can talk about clothes. You can talk about cars. The point here is that there is a lot of level of indulgence even within what we say orthodox Islam. And nobody's really uh, looking at it uh, at that level, you know, where they're saying that, look, you know, if you say, for example, now, Irja, we're saying that detaches your actions with your iman. This is what the Murjis say. So, for example, if you don't pray Salah, you're still a mu'min. This is what they say. Ah, the Sunnah don't say that. But now if you look at what's going on today, okay, yes, he's praying his salah, he has tawheed, he's praying his salah, but in this aspect of sports, we are completely detaching it and leaving it completely separate from Islam. As if it's an uh, aspect of your life that Islam doesn't really govern. So you can watch sports all day, you can talk about sports all day, you can whatever you want to do. I mean, sports is just one example. I'm sure there's many other examples. and You guys probably know better than me in society actually what's going out there. But my point here is, is that people have become infatuated with things that are un-Islamic and is taking over their lives. The Muslim, the Salafi especially, is driven by pleasing Allah in every single aspect of his life. From the moment he wakes up, there's a dhikr, until the moment he goes to sleep, there's a dhikr. And in between, it's full of actions that he can please his Lord with. You know, there's not a moment that he can spend outside of pleasing his Lord. I'm not trying to say we become monks. But if you have the correct intention, even playing with your children is an act of ibadah. Even helping your family members is an act of ibadah. And this is the life that we should be living in. How can watching a game of football be an act of ibadah? How can you think and say, SubhanAllah, this game is really good. MashaAllah, he's a really good footballer. It doesn't work like that. You know what I'm trying to say? So the point here is, is that there is this level of ijad, there's this level of detachment from what we know as Salafi, what we see in the books of, and the lives of the ulama, but now because there's so much fitna outside Twitter and, like I say, sports. I'm going back to sports because I can't really think of anything else. And I don't know really what's going on out there, but sports has never really gone away. Um, okay, so then he went to Dariya. Now they wanted Riyadh because Riyadh was the hotbed of Najd, and this is where a lot of people were, and this is where a lot of the economy was. And Najd was, uh, sorry, Riyadh was ruled by a person called Daham ibn Dawas. And his brother, Sheikh Muhammad's brother, Abdul Wahab's brother, actually lived with him and supported the anti Wahhabi call at that time. They call him a takfiri, they call him all sorts. And what they did is they used his brother to come up with an anti Wahhabi propaganda. They said, look, here's the brother. He's his elder brother. He's more knowledgeable. He lives in Riyadh, bigger city. Look what he's saying. 
He, we, we are with the Ottomans. Don't listen to this guy. They're a small area of the Riyadh. If anybody's been to the Riyadh, it's very, very small. And he's insignificant. Don't listen to this guy. Um, so they rejected the call of Quran and Sunnah that uh, Sheikh Muhammad came with. And uh, they claimed that he was a takfiri. They claimed all these different things. Uh, just to note, against the Sufis who used this until today, Ibn Ghannam states that he later repented because of the proof, and he was inspired by the works of Ibn Taymiyyah and Maqayim. So his own brother, that they used until today, he actually repented. Uh, Ibn Bishr said that he actually repented, and he went to Daria, and he got a stipend from the government, and he sought asylum against those people that he was before, because he feared for his life. Uh, so the anti-Wahhabi propaganda is nothing new. Uh, some of them claimed that he was a Khariji, some of them claimed even they went as far uh, a man called Haddad uh, ibn, uh, oh, sorry, Muhammad ibn Afalik said that Sheikh Muhammad is claiming to be a prophet. He's claiming to be a prophet just like Musaylimah was. He is the modern day Musaylimah of Najd. Muhammad ibn Fayroz said that, subhanAllah, Muhammad ibn Fayroz said that his mother, Sheikh Muhammad's mother, made zina with Iblis. And he is the product of this zina. Muhammad ibn Fayroz said this. Uh, his mother, Muh Sheikh Muhammad's mother. Look at the contradictions. What happened to Suleyman? <laughs> uh, that his mother made uh, zina with Iblis. And he is the, the product of this. Ahmad al-Qabbani, another person of theirs, said that... And he was, he was a scholar. As in, he was somebody that people listened to. And uh, they said that uh, he's calling people to leave the following of hadith and leave the following of the Qur'an. Now, like I said, mocking uh, Sheikh Muhammad is nothing new. But unfortunately, they miss a very, very important point. His name is Muhammad, his name is not Abdul Wahhab. Abdul Wahhab is the name of his father. So when we say Wahhabi, who are you talking about? His father's got nothing to do with the Dawah. That's factually. Islamically... Wahhab is the name of Allah. Uh, Allah says in Surah Al Imran, Rabbana la tuzukulubana, but they say it's not. Wahhab is the name of Until Wahhab. So if we're using one of the names of Allah or his attributes as a derogatory term, or even as far as they're saying to label a group which is outside the fall of Islam, they are kuffar. We are kuffar according to these Sufis, and we will call these kuffar Wahhabis then this clearly shows that the level of Tawheed is not there. And like we said, you know, factually they are you know, disrespecting the father of Sheikh Muhammad, not Sheikh Muhammad himself. So uh, quickly moving on, I'm sorry I'm taking your time here. Uh, the Riyah became a, a fortress of Tawheed. People again came to study there. Uh, now the Sharifs of Mecca and the Ottomans became very, very worried. It became a fortress. They couldn't knock it down. Uh, the da'wah of Tawheed spread to Najran. Najran, until now there's a Shia influence, but the Shias uh, got a connection with Dariya, and the Shias became uh, Sunnis. And uh, he began to uh, great, create treaties with other tribes, surrounding areas. And then they tried to infiltrate a war against Riyadh. Uh, Muhammad uh, Ali Saud, who was the leader at that time, passed away and his son Abdul Aziz came into power. Uh, and Daham, the, the ruler of Riyadh at that time, uh, continued to you know, be at loggerheads with Daria. And eventually it fell. And eventually Riyadh fell. And the da'wah of uh, Tawheed and Sunnah entered into, uh, into Riyadh. And there now we used, uh, Ahl Sunnah were able to use a lot of money to pump the dawah and help a lot of the poor people. It's been narrated that they actually helped a lot of poor and the orphans. They set up orphanages and they were able to help people around the different areas like Bureda and Zulfi. And these people, they came and it became a, a broader uh, sense of dawah. Abdul Aziz, now the new uh, ruler, later on retired and he just focused his life on worship. So this clearly shows the effort of uh, Sheikh Muhammad and his impact on the rulers. And the attitude towards the rulers as well. Until now, unfortunately, people are saying bad things about al Saud. I mean, this is not a political uh, defense of anybody. This is not my point. But the point here is 
that we have to be just when we're looking at the rulers. So if the ruler retracts himself so that he can worship Allah, and he says, I don't want nothing to do with rulership now, I've done my job. Uh, so then they started focusing on Najran in different areas, and then the Sharifs of Makkah, like we said, uh, were, were, were really worried. So what they did is they employed Bani Khalid. They knew that Bani Khalid, they did it with Urayna, with uh, Uthman ibn Muammar. This is the only day that we can get rid of uh, Sheikh Muhammad. So the Sharif at that time was a man called Ahmed. What he did, he said that, you know what, let's not get, uh, let's not get physical. Let's call a debate. Let the people decide. So what they did is they had a debate between, uh, you know, obviously the idea of Tawheed and Shirk and following the Sunnah and Taqlid. And uh, the Sheikh uh, debated a man called uh, Hussein. Uh, the Sheikh clearly won over a lot of people. Um, but unfortunately, obviously on a political, because it was, the agenda wasn't that, you know, that they find the truth. The agenda was to try to expose this man, Sheikh Muhammad. But obviously they were not able to do that. So things continued the way they were. But unfortunately for them, the da'wah actually got exposed. It was a way that the da'wah actually helped, you know. Um, so Bani Khalid, this is the debate that was set between Bani Khalid and, and Sheikh Muhammad. Uh, and then obviously now they were fearing that there was going to be a lot of internal civil war because people are now trying to follow this way, and then unfortunately, Sheikh uh, Muhammad passed away, but he he died in uh, a peaceful life, and he died without you know someone trying to assassinate him, or he didn't die on 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 the battlefield. And uh, later on, the the da'wah of uh, Al Saud expanded, but then unfortunately, and the Amir of Egypt, who was an, you know from the Ottomans, Muhammad uh, Ali Pasha, led a war. Against the Riyal and Dariya, and he completely destroyed the Riyal and Dariya, completely eradicated the dawah of uh, the Sheikh, and Al Saud ran off in exile to Kuwait. And then afterwards, you know, they got support, and then there was the first do- that was the first dola. That's what they referred to the first Saudi, uh, you know, uh, establishment. And then there was a second one a year after, and then there was a third one, and this is the one that we know today. Uh, of uh, the grandson of of uh, the first uh, uh, Al-Saud Sheikh Muhammad uh, and this is basically the end of the Sheikh's life and now as the scholars do when they're talking about the seerah of people they usually end with some of the achievements and some of the characteristics of Sheikh Muhammad so we'll end with a few benefits here one of the biggest benefits that we can learn is that we can learn who a true scholar is now this is a lot of there's a lot of problems now today between people defining what a scholar is. They listen to somebody who's quite inspirational and he speaks nicely and they think, oh, this man's... The more they listen to him, the more they get affected by him, they think this man's a scholar. I don't want to name any names. It's not befitting. And to be honest, this doesn't necessarily need names because if you look at every single branch of Islam or if you even look at different generations of different people, uh, you know, age groups or genders or cultures, everyone has it. They say, this man is the man for us. Or this man, you know, he's quite inspirational. But this doesn't really define in the Sharia what an alim is. Some of the scholars in general have said that an alim has four major sifat. It's four major characteristics. The first one is that he has the ability to understand the Quran and the Sunnah. He has the ability to understand the Quran and the Sunnah and he's able to derive rulings from the Quran and the Sunnah. The second one is that he attaches his da'wah to the akhirah. It's not political, it's not social, uh, it's not something that he wants to get famous by. He's constantly reminding the people of the akhirah. You can tell by his manners and his dealings with the people and that he is... His main concern is to bring people back to Allah and bring betterment for the people through Tawheed and the Sunnah. So these are four characteristics. The first one, he understands the Kitab and Sunnah and he's able to extract rulings from it. The second one, he attaches the people to Allah and the Akhirah. The third one, he can tell by his manners and the way he deals with the people. And the fourth one is that he's looking for betterment for the people by having... Or focusing on the Quran and the Sunnah. And if you look at the life of Sheikh Muhammad, this is exactly what he did. 
Firstly, he uh, got rid of jahiliyyah that was in the, in the ummah at that time. Like we said before, prostitution, homosexuality, bloodshed, uh, you know, a, a lot of bickering between the, 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 the tribes and killing between the tribes. He completely got rid of that. He was softly spoken in himself. So this is touching upon his manners and his attitude. Uh, he always used wisdom and he always thought about others. He always thought about how can he deliver the message of Islam and the haqq to these people. It wasn't that this is my way and a khalas, you know. He was always considerate of the situation. Uh, he was very strong in, in his worship. He used to pray at length. He used to supplicate a great deal. Uh, he would take a debt upon himself to help the poor and the needy. He would take a debt upon himself to help the poor and the needy. He would follow the haqq even if it came from his enemies. If one of his enemies had claimed against something against him and it was true, he would accept it. And he would write a letter saying that I've accepted what you've said. Jazakallah khair. He was just with his enemies. Uh, he mentioned their good points. And he, not, he wasn't overcritical. And he didn't mention anything which was irrelevant in his criticism. If he was talking about somebody when he had debates, when he talked... He mentioned the good points that he had. Now, we're not talking about that you have to talk about the good points. We're just talking about the mannerisms that he had and the hikmah that he used. And he instilled taqwa and love and a hatred for shirk and bid'ah uh, to the people. So as you can see that this man was a great man. And obviously, if we've learned a lot just from looking at his life, then we can learn a lot from the knowledge that he has written in his book. So inshallah, from next week, we can, uh, from next uh, Friday after Salat al-Isha, this will be the regular uh, post because I think uh, the Shaykh coming tomorrow to give a lecture after, after Maghrib. So the masjid thought that there may be an overlap. So we will continue, inshallah, next week uh, after Salat al-Isha. Hopefully the dars will be about an hour long, half an hour for Aqidah and half an hour for Fiqh. And like we say, what I'm going to try and do is try and make it relevant. Uh, we find a lot of shuruh, especially if the brothers speak Arabic and they understand Arabic. You'll find a lot of uh, explanations for these books, nothing new. But what we need to do is look at the concepts within the book and how they apply to society that we live in today. And this is, inshallah, what we'll try and do from the aqidah aspect and also somehow from the fiqh aspect on how we can understand, like we were saying before, the different ishtihadat and how we can you know, look at the greater wisdom behind living in a multicultural society where there are different ishtihadat, even within Salafiyah and without Salafiyah, outside of Salafiyah. Ask Allah to make this beneficial for ourselves and Allah have mercy on our ulama mm -hmm. and preserve the ones that are remaining. Mm -hmm. Hada wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.